published work. And since starting my lab, we've really um, began to think about ways in which we can use the zebrafish model for illuminating questions in metastasis, the cause, obviously, of most deaths from solid tumors. And um, really, this is a new field for us and a new field for the zebrafish, um, actually. Um, and as Harriet said, one nice thing about the zebrafish is it's a, an incredibly small field right now. There's very few people working on zebrafish cancer. And this gives us a lot of opportunity because it is a pretty collaborative, um, pretty collaborative environment. So mainly what I'm going to talk about today is the biology of how tumors achieve this process of metastasis. And I think as laid out by Joan Massage and others, we've begun to understand some of the frameworks for thinking about metastatic biology. And I think we're all familiar with the initiating events that lead to primary tumor formation, including obviously mutational events, um, activation of angiogenesis and stromal activation. And then I think we're beginning to recognize either each of the subsequent events that lead to macrometastatic um, success. And this includes things like dissemination, how they get away from the primary site, how they go through circulation and sort of recognition now of things like uh, circulating tumor cells, even circulating uh, uh, free DNA as well. And then many, um, but not all tumors, go through this process of micrometastasis. And this is where cells land in a secondary tissue, a brain or a liver, and really just hang out there for a very long time. Some people link this to a stemness program, a non-proliferative program, not all. Um, the, it is somewhat clear that they undergo periods of immune evasion where these cells are at such low burden, they probably don't activate the immune system uh, to a recognizable level. And then eventually, tumors undergo this process of macrometastatic growth where they reactivate, they co-opt many of the microenvironmental factors, recirculate, and, and some people even think undergo tertiary seeding um, uh, either to, second, to new sites or back to the primary tumor as well. And as we have begun to think about metastasis over the years, I think initially when we all started in this, there was a underlying um, thought that many of the um, uh, factors underlying metastasis would be genetically driven. And as laid out here, one way of thinking about this is that you could have an early primary tumor that then disperses and many of the mutations um, would be part of the primary tumor genetic compartment. And then uh, another model would be that you would get dispersion of metastatic cells and then you would get post-metastatic mutations and then this would would uh, constitute the metastatic genetic compartment. But of course, it's turned out not to be this straightforward in the sense that there's remarkably little data right now, or at least clean data, showing that there are true genetic metastasis drivers. And that's not to say that in an individual patient, genetic uh, mutations or uh, genetic alterations are, aren't important in metastasis, because I think on an individual level, they likely are. Um, but there's certainly no recurrent um, obvious genetic drivers of metastasis. And I think that um, this has led um, those in the field to rethink other things besides genetic mutations that may dominate in metastasis. And part of this um, is now recognized to be really the important aspects of how metastatic cells, once they arrive in a new location, can undergo phenotype switching or phenotype changes in the absence of genetic mutations. So this is often looped, um, uh, sort of lumped under the category of plasticity. And plasticity can um, include many things, such as the reverse DMT or mesenchymal epithelial transition, stress signals, and really dominant effects of stromal signals that allow genetically otherwise heterogeneous cells to then and regrow in a secondary site. And I think that this diagram and this one um, illuminated here really points out that many of these signals that allow tumor cells to undergo these shifts in their new location, whether it be the brain or the liver, are really dominated by microenvironmental factors. So these are the tissue resident cells that are present at the site of metastasis that mediate these changes in how cells can adapt to their new environment. And these can include very well-known components of the microenvironment, such as macrophages and T cells and uh, increased B cells, but other cells as well as platelets and a variety of other microenvironmental cell types that I'm going to talk about today that I think are probably players in why cells can be successful um, in, in these secondary sites. And so when we think about these microenvironmental forces, one of the advantages of using the zebrafish is that it allows us to take a fairly unbiased view of what microenvironmental forces might be important in metastatic progression. So we know that there's you know, very heterogeneous tumor populations, which can be in some cases genetic, but in other cases epigenetic. Um, uh, or signaling, and then there's really a whole variety of these different microenvironmental cell types that come to play in the way that these cells can succeed or not succeed in their secondary uh, locations. 
And so when we think about this, we often think about this as a fitness landscape. So rather than thinking of cells that are either metastatic or not metastatic, I tend to think of these things as a landscape of metastatic fitness, meaning there are going to be peaks and valleys of metastatic fitness. And those peaks and valleys are going to be dependent on the particular genotype of the cell, so the genetic changes, as well as the epigenetic imprinting in that cell. But of course, these intersect in very important ways with the geographic dispersal, meaning that not every mutation mutation is created equal, so you could have a mutation that confers a significant advantage in the brain, but after actually offers no advantage in the liver and perhaps a disadvantage in the liver. And so I think that this aspect of geography is an important way that we have to think about these peaks and valleys of metastatic fitness, because each of these interplay to produce greater or lesser degrees of, of metastasis. And so my laboratory has primarily focused on melanoma. which, as all of you here know, is a disease of transformed melanocytes for the most part. Um, and one of the reasons why melanoma is such a great model for these questions is because it has such striking heterogeneity. And this occurs at many different levels, clinical, cellular, and genomic levels. I think it's now recognized that um, uh, melanoma is amongst the most genetically heterogeneous of all um, uh, uh, tumor types, perhaps the most genetically heterogeneous. And of course, one really important thing for us is that the majority of melanomas are localized, right? You know, these tend to present a stage one uh, disease in many cases, but rapidly fatal once metastatic, and perhaps probably the most rapidly fatal um, once in the metastatic site. And so this gives us a great bookend for thinking about metastasis, because you have many, many cases that are localized, many, many cases that are metastatic, and in terms of modeling that biology, it's useful to have these two sort of opposite extremes. And I think um, this is now quite an old diagram looking at a lot of the genes that we know are involved in melanoma progression. And this is obviously a vast simplification of how melanomas progress from, you know, a normal melanocyte into a benign nevus, and then eventually dysplastic nevus, and then um, moving down into a, uh, a, an invasive cell type. And I think we now recognize that each of these biological events do have molecular underpinnings, um, BRAF mutations, CDKN2A loss, P10 loss, and a variety of other changes along the way. And it's not that, you know, I think that, you know, these uh, simplifications are important only for us to begin to think about what are some of the genetic changes that contribute to each of these stages of tumor progression in melanoma. But I think um, through work of many groups, including Marcus and, um, and Ruth and many other people, it's now universally recognized that the vast majority of melanomas harbor mutations in the MAP kinase pathway or activations of the MAP kinase pathway. Um, this can take a lot of different forms. Most commonly, this is mutations of the BRAF oncogene, typically at the V600E position. Um, we also see many mutations in NRAS um, and a smaller frequency of mutations in CKIT um, and the uh, uh, GNAQ and GNA11, which can activate this pathway. And of course, this um, leads to a number of downstream events which tend to be growth promoting in the context of other lesions such as loss of P10 or P53. And this observation of the critical role, of particularly of the RAF kinase, led to the development of the uh, clinical trials of the drug um, that targets uh, RAF uh, called PLX or PLX4032, now known as vemurafenib, which has led to some dramatic you know, uh, responses. I think a lot of us are familiar with this curve where the tumors really shrink and the patients do live longer but invariably all of these patients um, come back with resistant disease, nearly 100% of patients treated with MAP kinase inhibitors. And the patterns of metastasis are actually very illuminating. So this is a uh, really well-known uh, picture from the Boston group um, in patients treated with a, uh, the single patient treated with a BRAF inhibitor. So this patient has innumerable metastases all over the skin. The patient received amurafenib, had a dramatic response, and then the patient recurred. And what's telling here is that the patient recurred basically in every one of the locations that were present initially, as well as many, many other new locations as well. And obviously this patient uh, died. Um, I think he responded for about seven months. And melanomas are often called promiscuous tumors, meaning that they can metastasize very broadly, um, but they do have certain predilections for the brain, for the liver, and a variety, of, especially certain types of uveal melanoma, tend to go to the liver. And so um, we know quite a bit about the patterns of metastatic failure um, in this disease, and yet for the most part, we don't know why they localize or do well in these different environments. 
So as Harriet said, um, my lab um, almost exclusively uses the zebrafish um, for our studies, and I'll try and explain why we um, eventually hopped into uh, using the zebrafish when I was a, a postdoc in Boston. So this is what the fish look like, um, and they're about an inch, inch and a half long. They get their name, obviously, because they have stripes, um, and I'll discuss what those stripes are in a second. Um, and um, there are a number of different reasons we chose to use zebrafish, but I'll kind of just go into a couple that I think are highly relevant here. The first is, I think the thing that most of you probably know, is just very large numbers of rapidly developing animals. So a typical facility can hold anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 or 200,000 fish, and that becomes a scale of experimentation that you can begin to do genetic, um, large-scale genetic screens and genetic perturbation. And that was actually a lot of the rationale for why I chose the zebrafish was for this capacity for very large numbers. Um, the second is it's um, really fantastic capacity for in vivo imaging through some of the work that I've done as well as others, and it probably is the premier model organism for imaging in vivo in a vertebrate model. And the third is, um, and I think this is a very re uh, recent um, uh, development, is this capacity for high throughput transgenesis. And this is very important because on a given day, if two adult fish give birth to 200 or so embryos, and we have many of those, each of those fish can be injected with the DNA construct to overexpress a gene or now with CRISPRs to knock down a gene. And so we, on a typical day, if, every, if everything goes well, we can make 1,000 transgenic animals a day. And that just is unachievable in virtually any other uh, model organism. And then the final reason is I think why the fish really got known was, as I mentioned, this capacity for unbiased genetic and in some of my own previous work, um, uh, chemical screens. And this is where we, in an unbiased fashion, mutate genes and then observe the uh, resulting phenotypes to find out what caused that phenotype. And now we can do very similar things using small molecules, not necessarily to find drugs, but instead use the small molecules as genetic probes, basically, in, into the biology. Um, I always put this diagram up here because um, a number of groups have asked me when I give talks, do fish have organs, um, which seems kind of a, I always thought of that as a very strange question, but now I always just put that up there. Um, and so we wrote this review for Nature a few, um, uh, about a year ago, um, and they did this nice diagram for us. So yes, yeah, so fish, interestingly, have all the organs we typically think of because they're vertebrates. And in fact, I was telling Harry yesterday that I thought very seriously about doing my work in worms, but the problem with worms, although I love them a lot, is they don't have um, uh, the same vertebrate organs that we do. Um, fish do indeed have all the organs we think of. Um, so the fish get their, um, their name because of these black stripes, which are made of melanocytes, which are quite similar to our melanocytes, and in fact sit at a very similar place in the skin uh, to our melanocytes. And then they have a number of other fairly normal, um, their kidney is a little bit weird because their kidney is intermixed with bone marrow. They have a liver and a spleen. Um, they have a swim bladder, which we don't have, um, but their intestinal tract is relatively simple and straightforward. And so virtually every one of these organs has been studied at one point or another in a genetic screen um, because of the ease of seeing all uh, these organs. And they indeed have blood and they have lymphatics um, as well. And um, I think the other major advantage of zebrafish is um, in work that I did while I was still in Boston was we recognized that although the fish had all these great organs and that we could see a lot of things, the problem was as the fish get older, they become opaque, obviously. And the reason they become opaque is because they begin to develop <laughs> pigmentation that blocks the light, essentially. So we decided to engineer a fish um, called Casper. I didn't name it, um, but it is named after the ghost. Um, of course, my, my six-year-old has absolutely no idea who Casper is. She's like, huh? You know. Um, so Casper is an, ex uh, an exceedingly useful model for in vivo imaging, um, and you can see a lot with Casper. So um, there's its brain right there, that yellow mush there, that's its spinal cord going down there. These are individual eggs, that little tube there is its intestine, this is its gills, that's its heart. So without a lot of sophisticated imaging, you have this capacity for seeing what's going on inside the animal, and this obviously is a very powerful tool for in vivo imaging. So, the work that I'm going to talk about today really started um, with um, a number of attempts to make transgenic models of zebrafish cancer. And so the initial way we did this was um, in collaboration with David Fisher's lab at the, <coughs> at the Dana-Farber, now at Mass General, was we took the knowledge of what was emerging from the human genomic data and first asked, could we build a zebrafish model of melanoma that we could then use for all of the other things that I was talking about? And this was subsequently successful and published a number of years ago. Um, 
so this is a normal zebra fish here um, with its black stripes and its unperturbed. And when we took an animal like this and then overexpressed in the transgenic setting the BRAF V600E e allele, and this is human BRAF V600E, e, you can see what happens to these animals. They actually do not develop melanoma. They develop these severe abnormalities of their stripes. They basically get confluent stripes of melanocytes that are virtually all senescent. So these are sort of characteristic of a nevus. And so these fish largely had these confluent nevi. It's only when you cross this animal with a mutation in a tumor suppressor gene like P53, and now we know P16 and P10 works as well, building off of Marcus's work, that these animals develop these very stereotyped tumors and these um, very clear melanomas. And these are really a great model because they're so easy to score. And the other important thing is that it's 100% penetrant. So every single animal develops a melanoma between 4 to 12 months in that range, um, sometimes a little faster, sometimes a little slower. And interestingly, the majority of animals develop solitary tumors. Even though they have melanocytes all over their body, they tend to produce single melanomas. We don't actually understand the biology of why that is, but that is just the observation. They do occasionally pop up with extra tumors, but they tend to start as single tumors. And in all cases, they do require the loss of P53 function. So even if we put this on a P53 het background, they always get LOH of, of the, other, uh, the other locus as well. And so this was really the basis of the work that Harry had talked about earlier, which was using this model for a genetic screen and then a chemical screen, which identified a number of modifiers of this process, including genes like DHODH and setdb one um, What I'm going to talk about today is where we've taken this model subsequent to that to ask how these models um, metastasize. And so what we started out doing was something you know, seemingly simple, which was we just took a bunch of these fish and performed histology on them, because we actually had no idea if um, they even were capable of metastasis. And so if you look at these two animals here, so these are two different animals um, in these two panels here, these were the original, essentially, BRAF P53 animals. And what you can see in this animal is that these melanomas are incredibly well behaved. So this is um, the skin here. Um, this is muscle here. And the melanomas that we're developing were incredibly superficial. They really never penetrated into the muscle. And for the most part, these animals have a very, very low rate of spontaneous metastases, which is not surprising because they're not deeply invasive. But with an incredibly simple genetic uh, perturbation, so in this case, um, overexpressing on top of BRAF and P53, the histone methyltransferase set DB1, now we see these melanomas, which are no longer superficial at all, and actually dive deep into the muscle and disseminate quite rapidly. So this was important because this told us essentially that the melanomas in the fish were, were relatively easily capable of metastasis. We went in and looked at some of the sites of metastasis, and they do tend to go to certain locations. So they tend to go to the kidney marrow. As I mentioned earlier, for some bizarre reason, the zebrafish kidney is a weird organ in which the bone marrow and the kidney are all intertwined. Um, we actually don't know why that is exactly. But when we did histologic staining of a number of these kidney marrow areas, you can see obvious tumor deposits right there. It stains positive for a, uh, a tumor marker that we have used a lot called Crestin, um, which is a, a fish-specific gene that marks these tumor cells quite well. And so um, we recognized fairly early that the zebrafish tumors on their own, just with BRAF and P53, are actually relatively low um, spontaneous metastasis rate, but this could be um, evolved quite quickly to become uh, widely metastatic. So with this knowledge in, my, in hand, what we decided to do was, um, again, building off of some of the work that Marcus and others have done, was to create zebrafish-specific melanoma cell lines. And the purpose of this was that this would allow us to more rapidly do transplantation studies, which would complement what we could do in the transgenic setting, but we could do these transplant studies on just a massive scale, basically. So what we did is we took a fish like this, a BRAF P53, um, we knocked in an MITF GFP reporter so that the tumors would be permanently GFP positive, and from this we created, actually it turned out to be about 43 different zebrafish melanoma cell lines. We, the one I'm going to talk about today is called ZML1 for zebrafish melanoma 1. Um, we call it that just because it's the most robust and it's by far the one we have the most experience with. And so these lines turned out to be incredibly useful for us because what it allowed us to do was to do relatively simple assays like this, where we could take our GFP-labeled fish-specific melanoma cells, 
and then transplant them into the CASPER recipient, which is transparent. And by doing this relatively simple assay, what this lets us do is to see things like this. And so this is what typically happens with the fish, where you see this is where we put the tumor, so it's implanted right there, and you can see it grows very robustly in the skin. And then these tumors with a very predictable um, uh, kinetics then metastasize to certain locations. So in this example, this metastasized in about 7 or 14 days, somewhere around there, and this was a single metastasis, and it had about 200 cells in it. And now with a lot better imaging, we can even see fewer cells than that. We can see single cells as they arrive in new locations. So this is pretty exciting for us because we could visualize and then subsequently go in and, and perturb this metastatic process. So one of the questions that we wanted to ask was what are the kinetics of this metastasis because as I said earlier human melanoma is a pretty promiscuous disease but does have patterns um, and so we wanted to know if the fish had similar patterns and so um, uh, one of the postdocs in the lab created this movie um, and this is a, uh, a movie taken over about a month of how the tumors develop and I'll just show this and how it works. So this is where the tumor starts. You can see it's all GFP positive and it grows, and then it goes to that location, and then it goes to tertiary locations like that. And this pattern, which we now recognize, is highly stereotyped and tends to recur in the vast majority of the fish, where it goes like that, and then it goes like that, and then it goes like that. And these sites are important because this whole sort of gamish right here of tumor right there is actually composed of two primary sites. One are subcutaneous metastases where they go to other skin sites. And then down here, under here, are actually kidney marrow metastases. And those are the primary sites it goes to. It occasionally goes into liver. Uh, this is an optic nerve metastasis. Um, we don't actually know why it goes to the optic nerve, but it's one of the favorite places that it goes. Um, and we're trying to actually understand why that is. So this um, was very useful to us because it allows us to understand how these tumors metastasize. And indeed, it seems to recapitulate what we saw earlier with the standard transgenic model. They go to very, very similar locations. And if we take some of these fish, and in this case, we perform an intravascular transplant, so we just don't even allow them to develop the subcutaneous tumor, just put the cells directly into circulation, then we get animals like this. So this is an animal um, about 60 days after um, the tumors were put in. And what I think is really cool about this animal is that this animal only got 50 tumor cells at the beginning. So we put 50. Five zero. We put 50 tumor cells in this animal and just let it grow for a long time, and now we get these profoundly metastatic animals that really have eaten through the vast majority of tissues, including, again, the optic nerve. This is kidney marrow here. This is muscle and skin. And so these are really, really deeply invasive tumors. And so I think one of the things we learned from this is that the tumors can evolve quite easily from their original BRAF P53 state, where they really just had two changes, barely capable of metastasis, and eventually they're capable of things like this. And they have many, many transcriptional changes from that initial state. They have many genetic changes from that state. Um, but we can e easily evolve these tumors um, uh, to develop metastases. And so we became really interested in this question of, aside from what was happening inside of the tumor cell, what was allowing these cells, once in their new sites, to do well in these sites? Because clearly we couldn't explain this, as I said earlier, all based on genetics. Because we started these tumors with, you know, as I said, two small initiating lesions, and, uh, and there are genetic changes, but not enough to account for this. And so we became very interested in what was happening both in the tumor cells as well as um, surrounding the tumor cells that allowed them to be successful in this site. And so the way we went about this question was to try and ask what were both tumor cell intrinsic factors as well as microenvironmental factors that promoted or were capable of promoting metastasis. And so the way we did this assay was we took animals like this, and in fact, you know, a bunch of animals like this, and then we disaggregated the entire animal into a GFP positive and a GFP negative population. And so this gave us the GFP positive tumor cells as well as the GFP negative stromal cells. And we compared those to control animals or control cells that had not um, been metastatic and grafted. And then we performed RNA sequencing on them and then used ingenuity and a number of other downstream analyses to ask what happened to the tumor cells after they engrafted in this widespread fashion and what happened to the stroma as they engrafted um, uh, after dissemination. 
And so when we did the RNA-seq and did the pathway analysis, really a number of pathways came out of this um, that we decided to look at. So these are things that came out of ingenuity on the y-axis, and these are the negative log p-values. And it was pretty hard to ignore the three things that were dominating this gene signature. And this was um, adipogenesis, fatty acid activation, and cholesterol synthesis genes. This was pretty surprising to us, in part because, you know, as a cancer biologist, I am the first to admit I know absolutely nothing about adipocyte biology um, or really very much about lipid biology, but it really pointed us in this direction that, you know, three out of the, you know, six pathways were all alterations in either adipogenesis or lipid biology. And so we decided to take this further to try and understand why would the disseminated cells producing a signature that were characteristic of adipogenesis um, to a certain degree. And we've done other work with these other pathways, including dopamine and endothelium, but I'm not going to talk about any of those until right at the end. I'm going to return very briefly to some of those other, um, other factors. And so if we look more carefully at what happens um, uh, to, this is the gene signature of what happens in the tumor cells themselves. I'm not going to show the microenvironmental signal um, just for the sake of time. And this, um, uh, this is a network diagram where the upregulated genes are in red and the uh, downregulated genes are in green. And so I think the most characteristic thing that we saw, and really the, the reason that this gene signature came out in the ingenuity analysis, was because there was a massive and nearly complete downregulation of virtually every lipid synthesis, de novo lipid synthesis genes, and this includes both fatty acid and cholesterol synthesis genes in the disseminated metastatic cells. And concomitantly, there was a really significant upregulation of a number of very well-known lipid transporters. And so this characteristic gene signature is really typically only produced in one situation, and that's where a cell, a, any kind of cell really, becomes suffused with lipid from the outside. And so this led us to this hypothesis that this, the melanoma cells were essentially characteristic of a cell that was filled with excess cholesterol or fatty acids that was coming from the outside, and the reaction to that was to downregulate the synthetic enzymes within the melanoma cell itself. And this data suggested to us that there was increased lipid uptake in the melanoma cells from the extracellular environment. And so we became very interested in this idea and decided to pursue um, this, uh, this concept that the melanoma cells were suffused with lipid and that's why we were getting this gene signature. And so to test this, um, the postdoc who was working on this um, developed an assay, which I think is a really cool assay, um, where she um, could take an, a zebrafish, and in this case, she could stain the entire zebrafish for uh, lipids using um, a, a, a lipid stain called Bodipi. And at the same time, she could transplant in tumor cells, in this case, into a subcutaneous site, and then ask what happens to these animals over time, with the idea being that if the tumor cells were becoming suffused with lipids, we should be able to visualize this. And um, what you can see here, so if you look, in this case, the tumor cells are in red. And you can see, if you just look at the most superficial level of, of expression, you can see all these tumor cells sitting right on the surface, which basically are large and hugely plump tumor cells. And actually, when you stain these tumor cells with Bodipi, we see that those indeed are tumor cells because they're red because they have an MITF tomato in them as well as um, green because they are suffused with lipids and that's sort of the overlay there. And this suggested to us that at least subsets of these melanoma cells were indeed taking on these characteristics of these lipid-laden cells where they're sort of filled with, uh, with lipid. So we wanted to quantify this um, more precisely. And the way we did that is we took animals now again like this, and we fact sorted out the GFP positive cells. And then what we did, in this case, the tumor cells are green. And then we could measure overall lipid levels um, from uh, cells that have been grown in the dish, or after five days of transplant, or after 21 days of transplant. And this is basically what the result was, is that we see if we compare cells growing in the dish or at five days sitting in the animal, so they're sitting in a subcutaneous site for five days, we really see no difference in lipid levels. But by 21 days, then we see this really significant increase in overall intracellular lipids, um, in this case stained by Lipitox red. And this really told us that Indeed, consistent with what we were seeing with the RNA-seq data is that as the cells engrafted in these subcutaneous sites, they about doubled or more their lipid content intracellularly as, as measured by this. And so that was pretty consistent with what we were seeing. 
We also went and stained a bunch of human melanomas to ask, are there examples of human melanomas that show this simil similar lipid-laden state? And in fact, if you look and, uh, you know, this is a simple H&E, you can see within the fields of so or certain melanomas, you see these really large uh, lipid-laden cells, like that one right there and that one right there, that are just suffused with lipid. And, you know, at first glance, we might have thought that those cells were adipocytes, but indeed, when we stain these cells using melanA or BRAF itself or SOX10, those are indeed melanoma cells, but they look, for all intents and purposes, kind of like adipocytes because they're so just filled with lipid. And so this seemed to indicate that both the fish as well as the human cells, at least subsets of these melanoma cells, are capable of taking up lipids and really uh, filling themselves intracellularly with lipid, in some ways, you know, resembling adipocytes. So we then began thinking about, well, where were the melanoma cells perhaps getting these lipids from? Because there are a lot of places they could have taken up these lipids from, including serum. Um, but we went back and looked at a lot of her, our histology from the zebrafish tumors. And so this is a, an H&E of a zebrafish melanoma. So this purple stuff here is all tumor. And we realized, and I don't know why this wasn't apparent to us um, earlier, but we weren't looking, is that, of course, these tumor cells, which are growing in the skin, are directly adjacent to the normal adipocytes shown in white here of the fish. And in fact, the tumor cells are sitting really enmeshed within these adipocytes. And this is uh, sort of muscle tissue up here. And this sort of led us to this idea, well, maybe the tumor cells, the way they were getting this, this you know, increased lipid state, were directly taking it up from these, you know, incredibly adjacent adipocytes. And, you know, in some ways, we, this should have occurred to us earlier because in sort of classic staging systems of melanoma, where we look at superficial melanoma and as it grows down, you know, beyond the dermis into the subcutaneous tissue, you know, this yellow stuff down here on all these classic diagrams, those are all fat cells, those are all adipocytes. And so, you know, this began um, to lead us down to thinking that perhaps the adipocytes were directly interfacing with the tumor cells to promote lipid transfer um, uh, in one form or another from the adipocytes uh, to the tumor cells. And so, to get at this question, um, what we decided to do is to, in this case, move to an in vitro system to try and get at some of these more cell biologic characteristics. And so we took advantage of these systems um, in which we could uh, set up adipocyte melanoma co-cultures for doing some of the downstream analysis. So these cells um, that we're using here, and these are certainly not the only way to do this, but this is the system we chose, um, in which we can take undifferentiated 3T3L1 cells, which look like this, they can undergo a differentiation protocol, including insulin and IBMX and a PPAR agonist. And these cells, over time, will take on the characteristics of uh, adipocytes, or at least, if not fully mature adipocytes, at least um, uh, partially differentiated adipocytes. And you can stain them with a variety of lipid stains and see they really gain um, these, uh, these relatively large lipid droplets. And so once we had the system in place in the lab where we could basically have cells that largely acted like adipocytes, we could then do a co-culture experiment where we could take these cells and add in our melanoma cells to ask is, you know, how the adipocytes that we think are having this effect directly interfacing with the melanoma cells. And so really one of the first questions we asked is how does it just affect melanoma growth? And so this is um, a really remarkable data in a lot of ways. So these are, um, in this case, A375 melanoma cells grown in uh, a variety of different conditions. So I'll just focus on this for a second. So these are A375 cells, uh, melanoma cells, grown in complete media. And you can see, um, and then here we're measuring phosphor H3 staining, so for mitosis, basically. And you can see these cells are growing, you know, reasonably well. When we simply co-culture the melanoma cells with adipocytes, we see this really significant increase in growth just from adding in adipocytes. We don't add anything else in. But this is really the coolest data to me, because if you now take A375 cells and put them in serum-free conditions, so they essentially arrest, so they're not growing at all, and simply add back in the adipocytes, this completely rescues the growth of the melanoma cells. And I think this is pretty profound, because what it tells you is that the melanoma cells, at least in this condition, need nothing other than adipocytes to grow. They can grow just by simply giving them back adipocytes. Even if you take away everything else that serum has in it, they'll grow. And we see this in a number of different cell lines. So I think that whatever the adipocytes are doing to the melanoma cells really has this profound effect on survival and mitosis of, of the melanoma cells. 
We also measured other aspects of tumor genesis using this assay. So this is um, an assay looking at invasion. And the way this assay works is we can grow our melanoma cells in the presence or absence of adipocytes. And then we measure the capacity of the melanoma cells to eat through a gelatin matrix. And this is essentially a marker of invasion. It's often used as an assay for invadipodia as well. And this is sort of what happens. So you can see these are the z uh, cells alone. And so they kind of leave these dark tracks in the matrix where they have essentially eaten through. And in the presence of adipocytes, you can see they do this much more robustly. So not only did they grow more, they really invade through this gelatin matrix um, uh, more robustly as well in the presence of adipocytes. And we can quantify this effect here in a variety of different cell lines, including SKML, as well as our zebrafish melanomas. I will say the effect of the invasion uh, properties here are not as profound as what we saw with um, the, the pH3 staining. Um, uh, but I think that probably makes sense because there probably is somewhat of a trade-off between proliferation and in invasiveness induced by the adipocytes. So then we wanted to get to the question of if the original hypothesis was that the adipocytes are able to do this by, you know, perhaps being the donors for lipids, we wanted to set up a system whether we could answer that question. And so the way we did this is we took the our 3T3L1 cells, um, differentiated them to adipocytes, but in this case, we pre-labeled the adipocytes with um, another um, uh, uh, lipid dye called Bodipi Red in this case. So in this case, we have these um, uh, differentiated or partially differentiated adipocytes in which the lipid droplets are labeled in red. We then wash away all the excess, and then we could take these cells and then co-culture them for a period of about 24 hours with our melanoma cells. So we just add these two together, and the melanoma cells, in this case, are in green. And then we let the cells grow. And what we saw was, was really pretty remarkable. So um, these are the um, cells after co-culture, and these are the melanoma cells labeled in green. And now you can see that these lipid droplets, which were previously in the adipocytes, are now inside of the melanoma cell. And this is the merged image. And I think this is, is pretty amazing because what it tells us is that these lipid droplets which come from the adipocytes can be directly transferred into the melanoma cells. Um, and so um, we're, so, yeah. So covalently, that's, the bodip is covalently bound to the lipid, to the active fatty acid? I or it's believe. Or oh, co-localizing to the lipid, to the lipophilic environment? I think it's co-local, although I don't want to say for sure because I'm not positive. So I don't know the chemistry about that. Yeah, but I don't want to say if it's called down because I simply don't know the answer to the question. So if you don't know, then it's not. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so then we wanted to quantify the effect here, um, and so we did this using a similar assay where we did um, the uh, ZML, uh, the melanoma cell culture here, and then this is the melanoma with the three T3L1s and then um, stained the melanoma, so fact sorted them out uh, to separate the melanoma cells from the adipocytes, and then stain them again with lipid tox. And so what you can see here is similar to what the imaging had told us, is that the melanoma cells themselves um, have a certain amount of lipid, and then in the presence, um, when they've been co-cultured with the 3T3L1s for um, uh, a few days, then what we see is an increase in overall lipid tox staining after the cells have been separated. Um, so sort of providing orthogonal information to what the imaging, uh, the imaging told us. So one of the questions that we wanted to get at and, you know, that we're still working through, and this is very preliminary and we're really just thinking about right now, is this question of um, to what extent does the co-culture system recapitulate what we see in vivo? Because we think, you know, all co-culture <coughs> systems are artificial, um, so we wanted to see how well they correlate. And this is, as I said, very preliminary for us. But we wanted to get a handle on this, and the way we did it is performing um, lipidomic profiling. This is done in collaboration with Metabolon because obviously we're not a lipid lab and we're trying to understand this. So we took our co-cultured um, uh, melanoma cells with the adipocytes, and then um, we also at the same time transplanted our melanoma cells into the fish and then fact sorted them back out after 21 days and then performed lipidomic profiling. 
And so what was really surprising to us is that there was really a single class of lipids that were altered, at least in this, in this experiment. And, and it was interesting that it was the same class of lipids in both the cold culture situation as well as the in vivo situation. And this is a, a molecule called hydroxy, uh, seral, um, uh, hydroxyl cer ceramide. Um, which, you know, this is very preliminary for us and we're still trying to understand exactly what this lipid is, but it certainly gives us a hint that what we were seeing in vitro and what we were seeing in vivo might indeed be related to each other, and we're really now kind of going down the, the path of trying to understand this with some collaborators with, uh, with expertise in this to try and understand what the nature of this lipid species is um, and exactly how it gets transferred. But one of the questions that we wanted to get at um, was how are the lipids being transported? And so we, you know, we went back to our RNA-seq data and realized that if the melanoma cells are taking up lipids from the extracellular environment, they presumably were likely doing it through a lipid transporter if they were taking it up from the adipocytes. And so we went back and looked at our RNA-seq for all of the known lipid transporters that we thought might be logical ways for them taking up some, um, some of the lipids that we were seeing. And so when we went back and looked, we realized that a number of the transporters were indeed upregulated. So these are um, the fatty acid transporters FATP2 and FATP, um, <coughs> excuse me, FATP2A, which is a homolog in the zebrafish, as well as FATP6. And so this led us to this idea that the melanoma cells, when in contact with the adipocytes, were upregulating some of these transporters and that perhaps these were mediating some of the lipid uptake from the adipocytes. And so we decided to go after asking this question on whether these transporters were important in the, these melanoma phenotypes that we were seeing. And so the way we did this um, is we did a very similar assay, um, and in this case we took advantage of a recently described FATP2 inhibitor called lipoformata. Um, so lipoformata is reported to be fairly specific for FATP2, and what this allowed us to do was to do our cold culture experiment, just as I described, pre-label the adipocytes, and then do the lipid transfer assay in the presence or absence of lipoformata. And the result here was fairly clear when we looked at it, um, so these are the melanoma cells on top, in this case, SKML28 cells. This is Herx stain for the nucleus. And as we saw before, we see the lipid uh, transfer um, uh, in the melanoma cells after co-culture. And at relatively low doses of the FATP2 inhibitor, we, we really saw an almost complete block of um, the imaging by blocking FATP2. So this is very encouraging that this was indeed the transporter that was at least partially responsible for the phenotypes we were seeing. Interestingly, we also looked at the capacity for uh, lipoformata, the FATP2 inhibitor, to block uptake from the serum because we also reasoned that the melanoma cells probably could take lipid not only from adipocytes, but probably from serum as well. And indeed, in a serum transfer assay, we saw actually an almost complete block of lipid uptake from the FATP2 inhibitor, really at, mic you know, in some cases, sub-micromolar doses. So this indicated to us that FATP2 at least was a uh, uh, responsible for much of the lipid uptake that we were seeing in, uh, in these melanoma cells. And so this led us to the last question on how does this affect the melanoma cells. And so um, this is a very simple viability assay. Um, and what was really, you know, kind of surprising about this is that lipoformata, the FATP2 inhibitor, so these are cells grown in serum and a variety of different cell lines, really have this profound anti-proliferative uh, effect on melanoma cells, really at micromolar doses. And in many cases, actually, these are as potent as a BRAF inhibitor, um, dose for dose. And so we see this effect very robustly across a number of different cell lines. And obviously, we're extending this now and looking at mouse xenografts and zebrafish um, as well. Um, but I think that this at least points out that the FATP2 inhibitor is quite capable of blocking lipid uptake. We think the lipid uptake is pretty important for how the melanoma cells grow. Um, and these are obviously re uh, required for uh, viability of the melanoma cells uh, themselves. So this is a, a working model, and by no means is it complete um, as we begin to think about how these adipocytes may be playing a role in melanoma growth. And, you know, and I think at least in subcutaneous sites where there are abundant adipocytes, we know from a lot of our own work now that the adipocytes are directly in opposition to the melanoma cells. In fact, they live really embedded in those melanoma cells. 
Um, we have evidence that they're capable of secreting lipids from there. Um, the data I showed, um, at least from the imaging we were able to do, looks like there is uptake of uh, those lipids into the melanoma cell. Um, we think at least part of this is mediated by FATP2, and we don't mean this to be cartoonish in the, in the sense that we know exactly how this works, but we do see evidence of these lipid droplets in the melanoma cells that can be blocked by FATP2 um, inhibitors, such as lipoformata. And when we block with lipoformata, not only does it seem to block that, it really has a pretty profound effect on the ability of these melanoma cells to grow and to survive um, uh, in this environment. You know, and I think this does lead us to a question of, um, where are um, these cells normally used, or where is FATP2 normally used during melanoma pathogenesis? Is it only in subcutaneous sites? Is it in other sites as well? And we don't fully have the answer to that. The one other point I'll just leave with um, that we're um, on this side of things that we've been thinking a lot about is where else um, these um, taking up of lipids from adipocytes might play a role. And so this is um, similar to the animal I showed earlier where the lipids are stained in green and the tumor cells are shown in red. And if you subtract out the tumor cell, which is right there, you really see this really interesting delipidification where you don't see any green essentially down, well, it should be colored in green, sorry. Um, uh, surrounding the tumor. And we certainly don't know what this means yet, but it's gotten us thinking about a question beyond just the ability to feed tumor growth and could this play a role in things like cachexia. I think it's an interesting and very open question as to whether a direct interaction between tumor cells and adipocytes could contribute to things like um, cachexia as has been suggested by others. I think it's a really interesting avenue for, for us to go down <coughs> in the future. So I'm just going to finish up this part and then I'm going to mention one other thing, which is that we think that microenvironmental factors like adipocytes can dominate growth patterns in, in many cases. And I think, again, I think this is going to be geography specific. I think that this applies very strongly in subcutaneous uh, metastases. It may or may not apply in other sites. Um, we think that at least part of this is mediated by the FATP2 transport protein. Um, the melanoma cells that are better able to take up these lipids have a really greater selective advantage. And that's not to say that melanoma cells in other environments not be, might not be able to use other sources of fat, but I think in subcutaneous sites they're going to use what's around them. Um, we can block this by blocking the FATP2 transporter with lipoformata. Does this provide a new therapeutic opportunity? We don't know yet. You know, I think time will tell and we're, we're exploring that question. Um, but I think it's worthwhile thinking about how these transporters, which get upregulated in the melanomas, might indeed um, provide a new microenvironmental therapy um, in melanoma. So the last thing we're going to finish off on is, um, let me just see how we're doing on time. Okay, we'll spend just the last couple of minutes describing how we're now expanding this beyond adipocytes into other microenvironmental cell types. So I think that, you know, we have increasing evidence of the importance of adipocytes, but there are undoubtedly many other cell types. And I think the zebrafish is pretty well suited for going after some of these questions. And so the way that we've been now broadening, the, broadening this idea of what I just showed with the adipocytes into a more genetic screen is that we now have the capacity for doing assays like this, where if we think about it, if we want to um, identify cell intrinsic factors in the melanoma cells that modulate metastasis, well, the way we would do that is we could genetically modify the cells but keep the recipient fish constant. But if we want to do the converse experiment, where we want to screen for microenvironmental factors that modulate um, melanoma growth and metastasis, then we could modify the recipient animal but keep the cells constant. And so this is the, the system that we've been using, um, and, and I think the enabling technology here has been the advent of CRISPRs because it allows us to rapidly modify this compartment and this compartment to do these types of, of uh, uh, screening assays. This did require a little bit of uh, work on developing some quantitative imaging tools, um, which we now, I think, have largely perfected. How do we tell the difference between this animal and this animal? Um, this required just a, a, a number of different tools to create heat map views of how animals progress um, and allow us to form curves, basically, of how many tumor cells the animal has and then how they form metastasis. But this has largely been overcome. 
And so now what we, this allows us to do using uh, CRISPR technology is we can take our zebrafish embryos, these are F0 just you know, embryos uh, blown up, this is the cell there, that's the yolk. We can inject in Cas9 protein plus a guide RNA to whatever gene we're interested in. We allow those animals to grow up for some period of time and we then transplant our melanoma cells into that mutant recipient background and then use these quantitative imaging tools and then for the most interesting ones we then take it out to the next generation in our original transgenic model. And so we've just really been screening for a little bit of time, but it's a very rapid genetic screen for looking for microenvironmental factors. Um, and you know, you can sort of uh, predict that some of the microenvironmental genes we're focusing on are adipocyte-derived factors, as well as um, another cell type in the microenvironment we think is important, which are keratinocytes, another uh, skin cell present in the local microenvironment. And so the assay winds up in this case where we take our melanoma cells and we put it into a wild-type recipient or a CRISPR mutant recipient. And I'm just going to show one example that's come out of this screen because I think it's, it's you know, I think demonstrative of the types of things we can see, and we've taken this to the wild type background. So this is an animal that's a wild type recipient. In this case, has two subcutaneous tumors dorsally and ventrally, and the tumors grow well. This is an animal in which we did not change the tumor cells at all, and all we changed was a single microenvironmental factor called EDN3B. And these lead to dramatically smaller tumors. But I think what's most interesting is that by changing this single microenvironmental factor, we can double the, so the survival of the animals by simply changing that one microenvironmental factor. And so this gives us a lot of confidence going forward that we can begin to screen for other more broad microenvironmental factors, not just in adipocytes or keratinocytes. I don't think we're quite at the level we could do a genome-wide screen, but I think it, it allows us to probably screen hundreds, if not thousands, of microenvironmental factors uh, using uh, this methodology. So we're um, continuing our work on adipocytes and keratinocytes, and I think um, conversations with Marcus and others, I think we're quite interested in exploring other cell types in the microenvironment, including immune cells, um, fibroblasts. We really haven't explored the immune component of this at all. I think it's a wide open field um, for zebrafish genetics, and we'd be really excited to, to start to do some of that work as well. So I'm going to finish up just by thanking a few people. So all the lipid work has been uh, done by a postdoc in my lab named Malmo, and the quantitative imaging and CRISPR screening was really done by a number of members um, of my lab, including two, uh, a post two postdocs and uh, two technicians as well. I'd also just take a moment to thank um, my funding, as well as ongoing collaborations with my former postdoc lab in Boston, Lenzon, and some collaborators at MIT as well.